You've heard uh, shale gas, you've heard unconventional. What does unconventional mean? Unconventional resources are those that can't be produced at economic flow rates in economic volumes unless a well is stimulated by hydrologic fractures, a horizontal well bore, or some other technique to expose more of the reservoir to a well bore. These are rocks that aren't going to produce economically unless you do something to them. So what do those rocks, what do those look like? You know, if you look at conventional, if you have unconventional, you must have conventional. Um, what I show, I'm showing here is a, is a scale of permeability, which is the measure of how the fluids which are contained in the rock will flow out of them. And, and uh, you can see it's a logarithmic scale. What is represented by conventional reservoirs of, of uh, 1 to 1,000 millidarcies or 10 darcies of flow is shown here in a, in a, a pict picture for scale purposes. You can see 200 uh, um, microns. Uh, what these grain sizes, this is a sandstone perhaps with, with conventional pore space and this is where conventional hydrocarbons are produced from. You drill a well into rocks like this that are buried in the subsurface and introduce a pressure drawdown across the well bore and the fluids which are contained in the pores of this rock will flow into the well bore and you can make an economic well. For uh, reference sake, as you continue to go down the permeability scale, we've got a con where a concrete sidewalk would sit. You know, you, you can put water on a concrete sidewalk and it'll pool, but eventually it'll soak in. So it's, it's a little bit less permeable, but that's, that's where that would sit. We've talked about how hydro, hydrofracks have been, have been done for 40 years and where they were pioneered originally was on tight gas sands. These are low permeability reservoirs that have hydrocarbons in them, but needed this kind of stimulation to produce. So tight gas reservoirs are um, anywhere from one millidarcy, which is a measure of flow, to uh, uh, 0 0.001, which is, so you can see how many, three, three to, to uh, six orders of magnitude less permeable than a conventional reservoir. So already we've got to work hard to get the hydrocarbons out of this. Now, why do, why are, where are shale gas rocks? Shale gas rocks, if we look at the scale of the pores that are contained in, in a shale gas in this picture, you can see the, the scale of, of the image, tiny here. There's 20 microns for scale. The pores that are present in here, they're actually pores that are found in the organic matter itself. As these rocks heat up and generate hydrocarbons, the organic matter shrinks and, and the pores that are made contain the hydrocarbons, the gas. But it may be porous. There may be a, a pore network in here, but it's impermeable. You can see in this scale, we're talking about nano darcies, 10 to the negative ninth darcies of flow. This stuff doesn't flow at all. In, in, if you just set it out and how long it would take for the gas to flow from one end of this room to the other, it would take 20 years. Uh, it's very, very slow. So these rocks would not produce under, under economic rates unless we do something to them. So what do we do to them? We fracture them. What we do here now is we, we take a reservoir, a big reservoir, and we introduce pathways for the gas. So this, this re reservoir here with these tiny pores are contained in between these fractures, which allow pathways for the gas to, it doesn't have to go very far. Now it just gets out to the fractures, and then it leaks into pathways, which can go to a, res go to a well bore and be produced economically. Sounds simple, right? So I'll show you how how that's actually done in, uh, in our operations. The, the natural gas production system has different stages and they're, they're all very carefully regulated. So as we're trying to develop this resource, it's done with care and, and consideration and control in stages from drilling, hydrologic fracturing, production, and gas treatment and transport. I'm gonna mainly focus tonight on the drilling and hydrologic fracturing aspects of it, but the rest of the production and gas treatment and transport, that's when you start getting into what Steve was talking about with the downstream uses and, and meeting the energy demand. What I'm showing here is a, a cross-section of the earth. The way, this is the way geoscientists look at the, look at the earth. We don't, we don't look at the surface. We, we see what's, uh, what's below it with layers of, of rock uh, 
impermeable and permeable, some that contain water, fresh water, saline water, and some that contain hydrocarbons. And, and we're going to set up with our, our drilling rig here to try to access the shale gas potential deeply buried in the subsurface. The wells which are drilled are, are drilled in stages, and at each stage, as we go deeper into the, into the earth, we set, we drill a hole, and, and it uh, starts with a large diameter hole, and as we get deeper and deeper, we get into smaller and smaller diameter holes to try to control the pressures in the, in the, in the earth's surface and, and to isolate the well bore from the formations. The, the challenges here are making sure that hydrocarbons, which are contained in the rocks down here that we're trying to access, don't get up into shallow aquifers where they can cause, cause problems. We want to protect that. So we start with a conductor casing, which is set right below the drilling rig. Uh, this may be 20 inches across, and, and it's the, the top part of the well. As we continue with the drilling, we drill the hole, we set steel casing and cement it in place. We drill out of that hole with the cement. We drill, we continue down across the aquifers and any, uh, any formations that we need to protect from what's coming down from down deeper. This is the surface casing, and this may be as deep as 500 to, to 2,000 feet down. You notice now we've got, we've got two barriers between the well bore and the formation of barriers of steel and cement. As we continue down to our objective, we may drill, we may put in an intermediate casing string if we need to isolate further the well bore and a production casing string, all the way down to the objective depth, which may be as deep as 14,000 feet below the surface. Just to give you a perspective of what 14,000 feet is, you know, three miles here we're talking about, uh, we've, we've scaled it to the Empire State Building, 1,400 feet at the Empire State Building. If you were going to drill these wells, uh, you, you could get uh, nine Empire State Buildings down and still you, would be, you wouldn't be quite to the objective in some of the parts, some of the plays that we're trying to develop around the country. So between our objective down here and the surface are thousands of feet of impermeable rock, which when we talk about what we're going to do down there, how, and you can see how protected you are from the activity in the surface, the activity down below from the surface, you can see a lot of section between you and the, and the objective. As we drill down to the objective, we drill vertically and then the technology that, that Steve talked about, horizontal drilling, is done with a, a mud motor, something that's put on the drill bit that allows us to steer the well bore and, and build angle so that we can take a vertical well and drill it horizontally. This is a technology that, that combined with hydrofracking has made it economic and, and uh, more environmentally friendly, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, to develop these widespread shale, air, shale plays. You saw um, if the conventional play, if a conventional field was the size of the Marcellus, you know, you might be able to develop it with a few hundred wells, but now you look at the Marcellus, you're going to have to drill thousands of wells to develop this. But we can't, we don't want to have thousands of drill pads around the play, around the Pennsylvania and, and West Virginia, so we want to minimize our, our footprint. As we drill down into the shale zone, we continue with our production casing that we push into the, into the end of the lateral depth and cement in place. Now we're in our, our shale zone, which is a couple of hundred feet thick and, as I said, thousands of feet below the surface. Now we're ready for hydrologic fracking to uh, to, to liberate the gas that's, that's trapped in these rocks. We first go in with a tool that perforates the, the casing and the cement and, and sends uh, an opening into the formation itself. Uh, we lower this on, the, on a wire line and then pull it back up the hole. Once we have, we've perfed our uh, casing and the formation, we then send down Water and sand, a water and sand mixture to try to break up this reservoir, this, sh this shale that we, that we talked about originally that need these pathways to free the gas, breaking up the, the formation and propping it open with the sand. So what we send down here is 98% sand and fresh water. A few chemicals 
to try to keep the sand moving and, and moving into the fractures and uh, um, allowing it to, to penetrate more deeply into the formation so that we'll have better, better connected pathways. As we continue this process, we'll, we'll next set another frac, a frac plug up the hole and continue with the development of this well bore. We set the frac plug, the pressure, allow, pressure drop allows the gas in the formation to flow into the well bore. If we step back and look at the well bore in total, we do this in multi, multiple stages. We call this multi stage fracking. So we have one stage of perfs and fracs that open up parts of the well bore. We set a frac plug, we move on and do the same thing further up the well bore, and then we do it again. Then we, we come in and we drill out those frac plugs and the gas which was in the formation flows into the well bore and up to the surface where it's, where it's processed and transported. So how long does this take? It looks like a big operation but in fact relative to how long this well will be producing it's a very very small amount of time. Shown here is a, is a timeline for a typical gas well from the start of the pad construction to drilling and then when it's set to facilities and, and, and producing. So you can see it is anywhere from 30 to uh, 100 days or so, depending on the drilling time, um, the time to fract, which is dependent on how long the lateral length is. The drilling time is dependent on how deep the formation is. The Marcellus in western Pennsylvania is 6,000 feet depth below the surface, give or take, a couple thousand feet. Um, some of the other plays in, in southern Oklahoma and uh, Arkansas may, or in uh, Louisiana may get as deep as 14,000 feet, so a little bit longer. But the matter of, in a matter of days, in drilling and completing and installing facilities, this well will, will now produce for 25 to 40 years of gas. So let me just uh, show you what the process looks like in animation. Hydraulic fracturing is a time-tested, proven technology. It's been used in more than one million wells worldwide for the past six decades. This is how it works. First, once the necessary infrastructure is in place, a drilling rig is assembled and inspected in accordance with the required safety and environmental standards. Only once we are satisfied that all the required standards have been met can drilling begin. When the well is drilled, multiple layers of cement and steel casing are inserted to create an impermeable barrier between the well and the groundwater. The well is drilled vertically until it nears the shale zone. Just prior to the shale zone, the well turns and horizontal drilling begins. The Empire State Building extends 1,453 feet from base to tip. The depth of a well can be over eight Empire State Buildings. After another cement casing is put in place to ensure maximum system integrity, a perforating device is inserted to create small holes in the casing and the rock. Then, fluids comprised predominantly of water and sand are pumped down into the well bore, creating tiny hairline fractures. Gas trapped in the shale zone is released within the tiny hairline fractures and safely brought up the well bore and to the surface. America has vast amounts of natural gas, which can provide a cleaner burning source of energy for more than a hundred years. Technology is making it possible to safely and responsibly unlock this energy endowment. We've talked about the well bore construction, but there is also the aquifer protection with the well engineering and the water management and recycling of fresh water use trucking and disposal. ExxonMobil and XTO are committed to recycling as much of the water as we can. We've talked about careful site selection and preparation as we approach a, a well site, working with the community, trying to make sure that we understand what issues are um, near the surface and near the subsurface as we, as we move forward in a development. You can see we have experience in developing 
shale gas plays in, in urban environments. We, uh, we also have experience in handling produced water in sensitive environments like in the, in the Peons Basin of Colorado. Multiple wells from a single surface location I'll talk about in the next slide, but community engagement and, and understanding what the community needs are before we get start a large scale development is, is important and that's part of the reason why we're out, out here talking with you all today. So how do we develop a field which is spread over three, three uh, states economically? We have to maximize our stimulated rock volume, but we want to minimize our environmental footprint. Originally, we started with one effective well to drill and, and complete these unconventional resources. Now, with horizontal drilling and, and multi-stage fracking, we can get 10 effective wells of completion from the same surface location. When we were in, in Western Colorado, our operations trying to reduce our, our footprint, we drill multiple wells from the same pad location. So we're able to develop a large area of the subsurface without drilling multiple wells on the surface so we can minimize our, our footprint. As we look at what we can do now with horizontal wells, from a single pad location, we're able to drill multiple lateral wells horizontal wells which can access a large area, a large rock volume in the subsurface but a very small footprint on the surface to minimize the, the disruption to the environment. So as we look at how this is progressing, you can see how the technology of, of horizontal drilling and multi-stage multi fracking is allowing us to drill many, many, many times the wells we would have done otherwise and do it with a much smaller environmental footprint. So the, then next is the safe treatment of the water after we use it. When you pump in the water and frack the, the formation, some dissolved salts may come out of the formation in the flowback water as, as the gas comes out. ExxonMobil and XTO try to recycle as much of the, the water which comes out for reuse in future fracking operations. That which we can't, we can send to industrial wastewater treatment plants just like other industry for waste treatment and if waste treatment plants can't handle the volumes of water that are developed or that are that are generated by these operations uh, sites which are selected for underground disposal with permanent wells are selected and contracted to handle that that volume I mentioned and you heard in the video about what is the hydraulic fracture fluid 98 percent of this is a water and sand mixture the parts which are not water and sand are chemicals that are uh, common industrial chemicals or, or some, some even food grade chemicals. Um, chlorine for reducing bacteria, uh, guar gum, something which is used in ice cream is used to, to help uh, keep the sand mobile as it goes into a frack. The, the uh, chemicals which are added to this just to make the frack that much more efficient, ExxonMobil supports publication and, and uh, transparency of what we're using in our, in our frac fluids. So there is a uh, website for um, frac ID. Um, we publish our the hydraulic fracking fluids on a site-specific basis and we promote that kind of transparency throughout industry. In the Marcellus, the water use for this drainage basin, the Susquehanna and Delaware Basin, is uh, is controlled by strict siting and surface water management requirements with legislation that's in place. The industry needs to develop all the Marcellus is projected to be a very tiny portion of the volumes which are generated and, and moved through this basin, less than, far less than 1%. In fact, the hydrologic fracking needs, the water needs for one well is something like 5 million gallons. Sounds like a lot, but 5 million gallons equates to about eight minutes of water use in New York City. So with responsible practices of reuse of the water and strict management following regulations that are in place, we can work this together with communities that we're operating in. So in summary, we feel like to develop this, it's critical to utilize best management practices on how to design, operate, and execute these, these wells. 
Critically important is protecting groundwater resources, minimize freshwater use, work with local communities to minimize the impact of the operations, and promote transparency and reasonable regulations to facilitate this kind of development. 